All right, welcome to not my van. This is my car instead, my work van. Um, so this one is gonna be about, um, I guess rules, rulings. Rules are weird sometimes. Definitions are weird sometimes, especially in 5e. And a little bit about like differences between DMs. So no matter what table you're at and no matter what, how good the synergy is, there's always gonna be a little friction in places, like especially with rule, rules and rulings, you know, certain certain rulings. It's just how one player understands something, and it might conflict with the way another player understands it, especially if that player is the DM. Um, for example, last night in our Ursheim game, I'm playing a Fey Wanderer Ranger. And I used the Beguiling Twist ability, which I actually got it slightly wrong. It's not that you take, or for, let me start from the top. That ability, when something in the area, it can be friend, you, friend, foe, succeeds on a saving throw against Charm or Frighten, you can twist it and force another creature to make a wisdom saving throw against charm or frighten for a charm or frighten effect your choice within like 120 feet of the original creature um, last night we're fighting a bunch of things so it still would have worked I could have just taken it from a different creature but because like the target creature I was trying to focus on failed or succeeded on a save I just made them effectively kind of redo it at least in the eyes of everybody else but then they passed their save. But there was some discussion and disagreement about it because the creature used legendary resistance to pass that save. So there was a little bit of wibbliness about it. Like, like two players, including the DM, kind of thought like, okay, well that doesn't really count because they didn't pass the save. They're using legendary resistance to not be affected. It's like, well, legendary resistance does it just makes you succeed the save. You ignore the rule. So it's like it went back and forth. They gave it to me. But I didn't like kind of starting, you know, being the the source of that friction. I wasn't a big fan of that. Um, but, you know, there's no... Re I'm still going to stick to my point that, you know, there's no reason that shouldn't have worked. But why would the, why would the other players think that, you know, the... Uh, that beguiling twist wouldn't apply in this case. Why not? Um, I'm not really sure. There's a lot of times where like certain effects, and this is part, this is a big problem with 5e, the way that like the natural language is written instead of using like tags and specific states and stuff. Look up the problem with Revivify if you want to know more. Um, some things like, if you really tease them all the way out, they don't work because of the way they're written and the way certain effects are supposed to play off of certain other things going on. So, like, similar example. the One of the players was the DM in this case. I'm playing my Barbarian, and I use... Um, it's a Zealot Barbarian, and I use the... Um, what's it called? I can't remember the name. Um, the thing, the feature where, as a bonus action, you grant yourself and everybody around you, all your teammates, advantage on attacks and saving throws for a round. And I used that when another player went down. So, essentially to give him advantage on a death save, that was my idea. Um, but there was disagreement about that. Like, oh, it shouldn't apply to death saves. Well, why not? It says all sa It says all saving throws. And that's kind of what I'm getting at here, that like, in that particular case, the DM considered a death save something different than a saving throw, even though it's just a death saving throw. So, because of like, the idea of what a death save is supposed to be, it's supposed to be like, just pure, not luck, but like, fate. Like, you just roll the die, and whatever you get is the result. But per the rules, there are certain things that can add to that because it's a death saving throw. While you can't be proficient in it, and actually, 
I think monks at level 14 become proficient in death saving throws because they are listed as getting all death saves. But this is also in kind of another... That's the issue with, with 5e. It's not, like, explicitly spelled out enough. It relies on just like this kind of natural language and letting the players figure it out as much as possible. Like, okay, did this feature explicitly say it? Then probably not. Did it explicitly deny it? Then it's fine. Like that, like this happens again and again. If you've, you've definitely run into this, if you've played 5e for more than 10 minutes. Um, but it's just one of those one of those things with the game. Like any kind of game is going to have not necessarily this problem, but some kind of problem. Um, and this is something I've kind of learned from my history of playing fighting games. Like you know, the first fighting game or two that I started playing, it was like and started getting into and learning more about. It's like, oh man, this game would be perfect if it only if it wasn't for X Y Z. And then a new game gets revealed, and you start getting hyped into that. And you get the game and it's perfect for like three days. And then you start to find the flaws in it. And you realize like, oh man, this game would be perfect if only if, if it weren't for you, Y, and V. They're not in that order. But for these other variables. And that's the same story every single game. There's always some flaw. There's always something. No system is, no game is perfect. No system is perfect. And when you're playing in especially when you're playing 5e with a group. There's going to be these moments of friction where there's disagreement over the rules, maybe with other players there's disagreement about what you're going to what you're trying to do, but disagreement over the rules is fairly common. And I'm not going to advocate for like some sort of divine arbiter of the rules that like, oh, if there's any disagreement for more than 3 seconds, ask that guy. That's not it. That's no. It's just everybody should know the rules as well as they can and try to be civil about it like we like our table generally is. Um, like if an argument or if a disagreement about rules kind of goes on for like I'll say more than two or three lines, we just tend to like sigh like just like okay, it's fine for this time. Whatever, moving on. Like we just kind of quash it and move on. And that, that's a good strategy. Um, I guess that's it about those kinds of rules. There are some other... There's always going to be weird interactions, too. Um, like, uh, what's a good example? Like, especially from earlier... Um, earlier uh, sources... You know, things that were written earlier, like the PHB and some of the earlier books, there's always going to be weird interactions because they, a lot of times, the designers kind of fail to account for things the character can already do. Like, for example, I like I think there's one or two like cool magic items that would be good for martial characters, but they don't work because instead of saying like when you make an attack, it's like. As an, as an action, you can add your strength and add your proficiency to make an attack roll. It's like, instead of taking the attack action, it makes you make an attack, which is technically different. <laughs> like, so because you're not making the attack action, it doesn't play nice with itself. So a lot of the times, a marshal above level five might not use that item because like, okay, well, it's better to just make two attacks um, than use this fancy item. Um, there's also cases where, and this is kind of like monster versus player design. Like monsters have things like multi-attack, whereas players have extra attack. And those sound pretty similar, right? They're completely different. <laughs> Like, multi-attack, it's it's listed in a monster stat block, and it goes, okay, when this monster, this monster can make multiple attacks as their action. One with their claws, one with their ass, and one with their um, philosophy degree. Something like that. But a player character who gets extra attack, they get 
Their feature reads, when you take the attack action on your turn, you can make one additional attack. That's all that says. And they don't play very nice with each other. Either they, they like, fail to interact, or they interact hilariously. And let you, if you somehow get both, like, there's certain readings of the rules where, like, okay, you can make one extra attack. That means you can make multi-attack from the, the monster stat block. And then, with extra attack, you can do it again. <laughs> so you can make, like, seven attacks or whatever. No, that's dumb. Um, that's not how that should work. But that's... There's a lot, uh, there's all, there is a lot of stuff in 5e where you kind of have to make a guess almost. Like, it's not super clear exactly how something should work, so you just go, ah, okay, yeah, that's fine, we'll do it that way. And you just kind of err on, like, you balance it as best you can. Like, in the case of a, a PC that gets monster multi-attack and extra attack somehow, yeah, you're not going to make the, allow them to make the whole monster multi-attack and then use extra attack to make the whole monster multi-attack again. And no table I've ever been a part of has ever done that, but that's just like the most extreme reading of that rule combination that I can think of. Um, but more, I want to, uh, additionally, I want to talk a little bit about difference in, in DM styles. Uh, a little bit. That's, of course, a, something that could warrant its own video, but something that happened also in, our, in last night's game is a player died. I mean, a character died. <laughs> um, the fairy rogue was hanging out a little too close to the ground, and one of the enemy goliaths jumped up, grabbed him, slammed him down. That put him down, and then on that goliath's next turn, because that goliath picked them, like, grabbed him out of the air as, like, a, uh, as part of a different creature's legendary action. Like, they have a legendary action like, you, fight that guy, attack that guy. Um, they had a bunch of those legendary actions, which are cool. But, so then, slammed them down, and then the Goliath's turn came up, and then they just put the, they just attack the downed road. Now, that's always been kind of a subject of, of debate. Would, should, like, should you, as a DM, finish off and execute a player character? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, especially if a character, is, if a monster or an enemy combatant is like lower intelligence, then sure, maybe they shouldn't. They just okay, this thing stop moving. I'm gonna fight the other guy now. Or I don't notice that the thing is moving, so I'm going to keep fighting it because I'm trying to eat it. Like you know, it depends on exactly what that monster is doing. But then when you have player or. Uh, like humanoids maybe they should maybe they should there's some enemy combatants that when a target goes down it's like okay they're no longer a threat at the moment I am going to continue to focus on the actual threat on the other party members that makes sense and then other times especially in this case that Goliath got orders to kill the fairy so, they're going to do that. Um, so, maybe that was an interest. You know, I thought, initially I was thinking that it was like a big thing about like different DMs would do different things. But, no, this was just a natural course of the psychology of, those, of that particular combat. So, I don't have a whole lot to say on that point, actually. Uh, just that the DM was doing a good job of following their own monster psychology. I guess, uh, but, well, there is one little thing I can, I can dig into. Um, one of our, we lost a player completely that dropped out of the campaign before this session. So at the beginning of the, of the session, their character had a heart attack and died, and they're out of here. But another player couldn't make it. Now that was going to mean we were going into this combat missing two characters because something this DM usually likes to do is when a player can't make it, their character gets separated and kind of like put in stasis or hiatus and they come back next session to avoid a character dying when their player isn't there, that kind of thing. But in this particular case, 
we were going into a combat down a character already. So, eh, we just, instead, we just collect, like, kind of collectively piloted the barbarian player's character. And it worked out. But, you know, that's not something this game and this DM normally does. We don't pilot each other's characters. And other DMs don't care about that. It's like, yeah, pilot the pilot the guy, it's fine. Or in some cases, like, they're there, but they're, like, fighting another dude in the background. That kind of thing happens a lot. So, you know. And, you know, different. there's different reasons to do that or not. Um, yeah, I guess that's... I was really wanted to talk about the first thing. This was just like a little extra thought that I realized didn't have as much meat, but let me try to talk about it as much as possible. Um, yeah, that's all I got for you today.